it, the heart muscle itself needs arteries and capillaries bringing blood to it. Okay? So we call those main arteries the coronary arteries. These are the blood vessels that supply the heart muscle itself with blood. And these are extremely important because if these blood vessels sort of get closed off or blocked and the heart doesn't get enough blood, what do you think it does? Stops working. And if the heart stops working, you die. Then you die eventually. Then that means all the other cells in your body are not going to receive the blood that they need and <coughs> cells can't survive without blood. Well, Granted, uh, why is it called an artery if it doesn't like leave the heart? It does. It leaves the heart through the aorta goes through an artery, and then comes back to the outside muscle of the heart. So it's still considered an artery. It's bringing blood away from the ventricle. All right, well, there are a couple types of cardiovascular disease we'll talk about. One is arterial sclerosis, which is the thickening of the arteries, the sort of hardening I don't know, of the arteries. And it often can be caused by the buildup on the inside of what we call plaque. A plaque is sort of fatty, waxy substance. Um, can be caused by the buildup of cholesterol and other compounds. And these substances can build up on the inside of arteries and start to make them more narrow on the inside. Here you see a normal artery. It's nice and smooth on the inside. It's sort of wide open. And here you see um, the buildup starting of that cholesterol, that plaque, making the passageway for blood to th flow through um, more narrow. And here you see a sort of a more extreme case where it's closed off almost completely. So obviously it's more difficult for blood to flow through this artery than it is to, blow through, to flow through this artery. Um, and so that can lead to some problems. Now what is cholesterol? Oh, it's a wax-like substance that your body produces in a certain amount. Your body does produce some cholesterol. <coughs> and where does other cholesterol come from? Food. Okay. Yeah, foods that we eat. It's found in animal products. So it's an animal product. So meats, cheeses, dairy products, they have cholesterol in them. Some have more than others. But um, that can elevate a person's blood cholesterol, and that can lead to the more buildup of these plaques. Right? Is it possible for the cholesterol to come Sometimes, uh, if it does completely block off the flow of blood, that's a complete blockage and that could lead to a heart attack or something like that. I mean, you may know, if you have any relatives or people you know that maybe have had heart disease, um, they sometimes will talk about, the doctor will say your um, coronary artery is 70% blocked or something. They'll do it in percentages to give a person an idea about how much narrowing there is. So, yeah. Well, we make our own cholesterol inside of us, um, but then we get extra cholesterol on the foods that we eat. So, you know, a person that doesn't eat any animal products is probably pretty low cholesterol, although it varies. Like, sometimes a person can eat very, very healthy, but still have high cholesterol because their body happens to produce more of it than somebody else. Um, so it does vary a little bit. All right, so that's, that's one um, type of cardiovascular disease. Another one's called hypertension. Okay? Um, high blood pressure. Okay. And that can be caused by lots of factors. Diet, lack of exercise, genetics, stress. So until period two, they're giving me high, high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily I'm a vegetarian, so hopefully I have both cholesterol. Maybe period two stress that they're causing me and balance out with my good diet and exercise, and I'll be okay. And you're good. Period three. Yes, you guys balance how to relieve my stress. <laughs> All right. Um, so high blood pressure means that as the blood is flowing through arteries, it depends how much pressure it exerts on those arteries can vary. In a narrow artery, obviously, when blood's going through a very narrow passageway, that can lead to an increase in blood pressure. Um, if a person doesn't exercise, doesn't eat well, they could have high blood pressure. And you know, when you go to the doctor for animal visit, they take your blood pressure. What do they do? They put the cuff on you, right? Yeah. And they so pump it up with air. 
And what is the, it's probably the nurse, what does the nurse do as she pumps it up? She listens to your pulse right in your elbow. And what they're doing basically is they pump up this cuff enough so that she stops hearing your pulse. And as soon as she stops hearing your pulse, it means the pressure in the cuff is equal to the pressure on your arteries. In that stop the flow of blood and she stops hearing your heart and that's your blood pressure. Okay, then she releases the pressure and then waits for it to come back, waits for the sound to come back, and that's the second number of the Wait, blood. so the longer, like the more tighter it gets and the higher she blood keeps pressure. hearing, but if she keeps hearing the pulse, isn't that good? No, because it means your blood pressure is higher, so oh. generally not. All right, so what are some of the treatments? Oh, here's just a little traveling down an artery until you get to a little gunked up area of plaque and cholesterol and so forth. But we'll, we'll move on. All right, so if you do have a blockage to one of these coronary arteries, there's some different types of treatment. A doctor, you know, doctor looks at those um, arteries and finds they're, they're narrow or they're partially blocked. If it's just a little bit, they may ask you to, you know, eat healthier, exercise more, and so on. But as they get more serious, they may do a procedure called angioplasty. In angioplasty, they take a... Um, uh, a tool called a catheter. It's on a very thin wire and attached to the end is a little balloon. And they basically insert it. Usually it goes into the groin area, into the main artery in your hip region, and actually stick this little tiny wire into the artery and they start threading it all the way up through your abdomen into your chest. And they can take this wire, they can get it all the way, they can loop it around the aorta, they can get it into the coronary arteries. They basically they can guide this. As they're moving, they guide it into the right spot. And then they use this wire to do um, a couple things. They can take and they can get the end of the wire right to an area where there's a blockage, a buildup. And then they inflate this tiny little balloon okay, with um, liquid. And as they inflate the balloon, it sort of smushes all of the plaques off to the side, kind of widens out that blocked, that blocked area again, hopefully so that blood can start to flow through um, better. So they get the balloon in the right spot, inflate it, then deflate it, take the catheter out, and hopefully it stays, stays open pretty well for the person. So that's what angioplasty is. Another thing they can do is insert a stem along with it. Stent is like a little mesh, a little metal mesh that they put on the end of the catheter uh, with the balloon. They get it to the area of blockage. So again, you see the, uh, the blockage here, this built up gunk. Then when they inflate the balloon, the stent, this little mesh, expands, but then it stays inside of the person's artery. And when they deflate the balloon, the mesh is kind of locked in place. They take the catheter out, but that metal reinforcement stays uh, in the artery and hopefully keeps the artery open for even longer. They also are sometimes have uh, a medicine that they release over time, these stents, to prevent more plaque from building up in that area. So a stent is just basically a way to try to keep that blood vessel open for a longer period of time. Okay. Can they do a guide class too? Yeah, so these are like the first stages because these are not that invasive. You would go, you could get angioplasty, and go home the same day or the next day and you're okay because they just had to put this little injection you know into your hip area um, but if this doesn't work if there's more severe blockages and angioplasty is not working and there's still uh, is difficulty getting blood flow to your heart then they may have to go on and do more serious surgery right? um, so could you like feel the stent in your blood vessel no you wouldn't feel it once it's in place you may you would probably feel the um, the guide wire as they thread it up uh, interior. I'm not sure. I have to ask somebody that's had a time. All right. So, um, somebody mentioned this just a minute ago. So, bypass surgery. Does anyone know someone that's had bypass surgery? My dad does. I thought he said he did. No. Huh? I don't think so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, he doesn't have like a relative. Yeah. So, bypass surgery is. You know, if you imagine it like this, we, we drove to South Carolina over a spring break, and 
Um, we got to an area on 95, a big highway, and it was all blocked off. And so we got off the highway, got off an exit, we took Route 501, we took it for a little ways, then we got back on 95, we went around the traffic jam, we got back on the highway, and traffic was flowing fine. So we got to, so we took a bypass. Well, the same is sort of true of um, the coronary arteries. So what, what you see here, normally the coronary arteries come out of the aorta, you see it here, and one goes to this side of the heart, and blood would flow through it, feeding the heart muscle itself. The other coronary artery comes from the other side of the aorta and feeds the other side of the heart. But what you see here is they've indicated those, those areas, both of the coronary arteries are blocked with this buildup. And so blood that's coming through the aorta can't quite get down here to these, um, to these blood vessels very well. And so that part of the heart will be sort of starved of oxygen. May not work very well. Same thing here. This blockage is preventing the heart muscle from getting blood. So what they do is they will remove a section of vein from somewhere else in the body, often in the leg. They basically cut it out. And then they are going to sort of paste it in. They attach one end up here. You can see they attach it to the aorta. And then they attach the other end down to this part of the coronary artery. So now as blood flows through the aorta, some of it's going to go through here. And it can get around this blockage and continue to supply the heart um, with blood that it needs. They do the same thing on the other side. They added another uh, artery. They attach it just somewhere else from up here and attach it down below the blockage to supply the heart with blood there. So that's what a bypass is, going around one of these blockages to get blood to the heart. But in order to do this type of surgery, what has to happen? How do they get at your heart? Open your chest. Yeah, they have to do major surgery because to get at your heart, you know, and traditionally, they have to make an incision through the, your skin, obviously, then through your pectoral muscles. Then what's under that? Your sternum. So they have to saw through the sternum, Ew. bone itself, and then they put a tool called a rib spreader. Looks like this. They put this rib spreader in where they saw the sternum, and then they kind of start cranking it. And it sort of slowly opens up and it spreads apart the two parts of the sternum where they, they cut, and that opens up the chest cavity so they can actually access your heart and do the surgery on your heart. When they saw the sternum, how, like what happened? Well, it's like any bone that you break will, you know, will heal eventually. So after the surgery, the bone needs to heal just like but a broken bone. But if they bone. saw it entirely, won't that take a while? Yeah, it takes a while. It's a major surgery with major recovery time. So they get the heart, the chest open, and then they can actually do their surgery. Now, the traditional way is they then, once they have the vein out of your leg, and they're going to actually do the bypass, they need to stop your heart from beating. So they basically stop your heart for half hour to 45 minutes to an hour. During that time, obviously, your, the rest of your body still needs um, blood, so you get hooked up to what's called a heart and lung machine. The heart and lung machine is sort of like an artificial pump that takes blood out of your body, puts it back in, and also oxygenates it to keep it moving through your body. So you have to be hooked up to that because your heart stopped um, to keep your, your, the rest of your body alive while your heart stops. They do the surgery, they restart the heart, then they sew you back up, but again, you need the heart needs to recover, that sternum needs to recover and regrow that bone tissue, the muscles, the skin. It's a major surgery that requires weeks and weeks or months of recovery for a person to um, be fully recovered from. It's a, so it's a major surgery. There are other, so I guess let me show you the video first of all. So this next video clip, if you don't like to look at this stuff, you may want to avoid it. Just, it's not really that bad. It shows, though, a beating heart inside of a person. Um, it's just like a close-up. You can see the rib spreader in there, but you can just see the heart as it's pumping. So here it comes. Is that what it looks like? That's what it really looks like. So you see the rib spreader on each side. It's open up the chest cavity. And you can, you can see the heart in here. Now there's two types of heart open heart surgery bypass. They can do, they can stop your heart, but there's also a way of doing surgery in which they don't. It's called beating heart um, bypass surgery, where the heart they don't stop it, they don't hook you up to the heart and lung machine. They have a tool that can stabilize a small section of the heart that's still, so the doctor can um, do their work. 
but the rest of the heart is still moving and still pumping blood through your body. That's called being heart surgery. Wait, my mom, my mom actually touched a lot of Oh, really? Yeah. It looks like an octopus. Yeah. Now, there are um, other ways to do surgery. Um, and so this is, so that's traditional open heart surgery, which is probably the most common. But now, doctors are starting to use robotic surgery. Um, and this is an example. This is a robot, this is called the Da Vinci robot. That's like a, that's the brand name. Um, and the robot, it's not like an automatic robot that does the surgery. It's, um, the doctor controls the arms of this, um, of this robot in order to do the surgery. And the way this works, the doctor is over here working at this council, sitting here, controlling the arms of this robot. And so they had this down at the high school. Yeah. And so I got to play with it. You could go and actually work it, not on a person, but with like some different tools. But it's kind of neat because you, you strap in and you're looking. So the arms, one arm has a camera on it with a light. So that they can see inside of the person while they're doing surgery. The other arms have various tools that they can um, attach. You know, pinchers to grab onto things, uh, suturing tools, cauterizing tools, all sorts of different things. And basically, you strap two fingers, your next finger and your thumb, into the robot. When you close your fingers, the little on the robot arm, those close. When you turn your wrist, the, the robot arm twists. When you move it forward, the robot arm, it basically acts just like your hands. But the doctor is very, very fine control. Now, really, the benefit is that they don't cut a person wide open to do the surgery. These tools poke into a person, okay? Like the bigger one pokes in through the belly button usually. The one with the camera and the light, because there's no scarring after it, obviously it's in your belly button, so no one's gonna see it. The others, they may insert like in below the rib cage. The others may go through between two ribs. And so you just, instead of having a huge scar and wide open, you just have these little puncture holes that need to heal, which is much less than this huge scar from traditional open heart surgery. And so the doctor goes in, they do the surgery um, using these various tools, and it's a much easier recovery. You know, they can do heart surgery with this, but they do all types of surgery. For example, my dad, he had his prostate exam removed because he had prostate cancer, and they use this same robot to do that surgery. It's just much less, it's a much easier recovery for somebody. They could take out a gallbladder or um, do all sorts of different surgeries using this. I mean? I want to go try it out at the high school. And like, you know, they cut open like a piece of skin, like a piece of skin, and you had to like remove something and sew it back up. Oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, I did the thing, you had rubber bands, like you could oh, take the rubber no. bands, you could, you could actually use these rubber bands and grab a rubber band, stretch it out, put it on something. It wasn't, after you worked with it a little bit, it wasn't, wasn't that hard. So that's pretty neat. So that's uh, the Da Vinci robot. Oh, here you see, here's a doctor controlling it, and here's what it looks like when the tool is actually inside of a person. Again, these are, you can see the arm is just sort of poked in to this person's body. Look like a little poke. Well, it's better than it saw it open and, you know, like that. All right. Okay, let's talk about blood type. This is the last new stuff that's done tomorrow, of course. Yeah. All right, so blood types um, are named, so we talked earlier, A, B, O, A, B, but the name of the blood type is based on the antigens that are found on the red blood cell. An antigen is basically just a tiny little protein. And these antigens are sort of on the cell membrane of red blood cells. And there's a couple of different varieties of these antigens that a person may have on their red blood cells. Okay, the blood types are named, so who knows the blood type? Anybody? I know my grandma's. Yeah. What's your grandmother's? Oh, something. Oh, yeah, my mom's. I, my, oh, like, oh, your mom's O. Okay. What's the most common one? Well, O, but, so anyway, if you knew your blood type, it tells you which antigens are on your blood cells. And there's only two antigens when we're talking about these A, B groups. There's the A type antigens or B type antigens. So if a person has type A blood, they have A antigens on their red blood cells. They don't really look like this. It's just to help us visualize it. But they have some little proteins attached to their 
um, red blood cells, those are the type A proteins, type A antigens. A person with type B blood has a different type of antigen, has B antigens. Now what do you think about a person with type AB blood? They have both. Yeah, they have a mixture of both of those antigens on their blood cells. In a person with type O blood, has neither one. Okay, then? A, B, and we'll, we'll, I have a graph, I'll show you that. Kimberly? I don't know. <laughs> Sophia? What, what's the difference between O positive and O negative? We'll get there too in a minute. All right, so that sounds pretty simple. The blood type tells you which antigens are there on the blood cells, but it gets a little more complicated because the plasma of your blood also contains something called antibodies. And these antibodies, they could attach to and destroy red blood vessel, red blood cells, if they have the matching antigen. An antibody matches with an antigen and then basically marks it for being destroyed. Why are they the same? Like when they become friends, you're like, yeah. Oh, so let's say now you have type B blood. Okay. What type of antigens are in your red blood cells? Antigen B. Right. So do you think in your plasma you have any antibodies against B? No. No. When you're born, you, you have the right mixture of antigens and antibodies. Because if you didn't, your antibodies would be attacking your blood cells and you'd be very sick or you wouldn't survive. So we don't, or when we're born, we have the correct, we have the correct um, antigens and antibodies. Because if like antigens mix with antibodies, it causes the destruction of red blood cells called hemolysis. Rupturing of red blood cells. Wait, is, that, is that a U or a V? That's a Y. <laughs> it's a Y. Hemolysis. Yeah. Oh, okay. so, so if a person has type A blood, let's just think about this for a minute. Which antigen do they have? A. What type of antibodies do you think they have? B. Right. They have B antibodies. And they're fine because the B antibodies aren't going to attack their blood cells. A person with type B blood has B, B antigens and A. A antibodies, and they're fine. Well, then let's think about a person with type AB blood, Ryan. Uh, they have AB antigens and no antibodies. Right, they have A and B antigens. So they don't have either antibody, because if they had either one, they'd be attacking their own blood cells. So they don't have either of those antibodies in their blood. Is that why it's the it's not. So we stop. And then type O blood. What type of antigens do they have? None. 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 What type of antibodies do you think they have? A B. Yeah, they have A and B. So when you're born, this is we don't really even have to think about this. When does it become an issue? So when do we have to be concerned about blood types? Brandon? When you get a look at blood type. Yeah, when a person gets a blood transfusion, we call that. So if there's an emergency, if you are in an accident or you lost a significant amount of blood, you may need a blood transfusion where they take blood from somebody else that someone's donated and put it into your body. The key thing to know is that when they, you get a blood transfusion, they only give you blood, red blood cells. They don't give you plasma and red blood cells. It's just red blood cells. So they have to be very careful that they don't um, mix the wrong combinations because antigens and antibodies that are alike would cause the destruction of the blood cells. So let's think about it for a minute. Type O, a person with type O blood, they have no antigens on the red blood cells. So who can have those blood cells transfused into them? Everybody. Anybody. Type O blood is called the universal donor. Because the red blood cells don't have A or B antigens, anybody can get it. <coughs> if you go, if there's an emergency and they don't know your blood type, but they need to give you blood immediately, they give you type O blood. Because again, it's the universal donor. Anybody can get type O blood and they'll be okay. If they know your blood type, would they give you Yeah, then once they know your actual blood type, they'll try to give you that exact matching blood type. Um, but until then, they would give type O, right? 
Aortus occurs the antibody that affects your blood. It does because they're only giving you the red blood cells. So they're not giving you the plasma, so they're never giving you any antibodies. Okay, they're only giving you the red blood cells. Have you? So if you have blood type A, but like the doctors didn't know that, and they put in like blood type O for blood transfusion, nothing would happen? Nope, you'd be fine. Okay. All right, well, let's look at type AB blood. So AB blood, they have no antibodies in their plasma. Who can they receive blood from? <laughs> Anybody. They have none of those antibodies, so they can get any blood. They're called the universal recipients. All right, so if we think about it, person with type A blood has A antigens in their blood, on their blood cells. They have B antibodies in their plasma. Who can they get a transfusion from? Two, B, two other blood types. Kimberly? Yeah, they can get it from another type A person or person with type O blood. Person with type B blood. Sophia? B and O. Yeah, they can get it from another B or from O. Type AB blood? Who can they get a blood transfusion from, Nicholas? A, B, A, B, or O. They can get it from anybody. And then a type O person, who can they get blood from? Well, they have antibodies against A and against B. Just type O. So if we look at the distribution of blood types in the United States, most people are type O, 45%. Second most common is type A. Then B and then B. Wait. Um, now there is one more. So several of you asked about this earlier. So when you talk about a blood type, not only do you usually say A or B or O, what else do you say? Positive or negative. Positive or negative. So when you're saying that, you're referring to a separate group of antigens, not the A and B antigens, but another type of antigen that's called the Rh factor. Rh factor is just another antigen. And people that are Rh positive, they have this antigen on their red blood cells. So Rh positive means they have the antigen. They're Rh negative, they don't have it. And it's just another antigen. And again, if a person does have the antigen on their blood cells, they won't have the antibodies. If they don't have the antigen on their blood cells, they will have the antibody. So, not only is O the universal donor, but who's more likely to get O blood? Oh, I mean, which type of O blood is the universal donor for anybody? O positive or negative? Negative. Right, negative, because negative doesn't have that antigen, so nobody is going to react against it. The RH comes from where it was first discovered. It was discovered on the rhesus monkey. Um, which is, they discovered this protein on their blood cells and then later on found it in human blood cells as well. And I believe um, Mr. Curie is already positive as well. I mean, um, when you do a blood transfusion, is there like a time where you need RH positive? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if somebody is type A positive, then you probably want to replicate their exact blood type once you know it. Well, what would the difference be if you put in either one? It wouldn't, but they just would generally use the exact matching blood. Oh, okay. There's other antigens as well that we don't really talk about, um, so there's a lot of variation here. Kimberly? Is there any easy way to find out what blood Yeah, it's really simple. We used to, we used to do a lab, um, I mean, way back. When I was in school, we did the lab um, where you poke your finger, oh. you put a drop of blood in four different things, and you mix some antibodies with it. And you see which one clumps up, and that tells you uh, which blood type you are. Like We're not allowed to do that lab. Because that's the only easiest way. Yeah, basically. What about like genetics-wise? You mean, could they tell genetically? Well, could they have an idea? Yeah, they would know. They could tell doing genetic testing. It's probably just simpler to tell 